Uh, Marios, can you elaborate in detail how zero knowledge groups work? Um, not in detail, but I can explain the general concept. The concept of a zero knowledge proof is proving that a certain uh, condition is true without knowing the inputs to that condition. So, for example, uh, proving that the amounts in the transaction add up. So the uh, the amount you're spending and the amount you're receiving add up to the same amount. Or if you like. If you subtract the outputs from the inputs, the result is greater than zero, and that, uh, or equal to zero. And that's basically uh, a common type of proof. That's called a range proof. Uh, this is one type of zero knowledge proof. You can do, in general, uh, mathematical proofs using homomorphic encryption, where what you're doing is you're applying encryption to the values. And then you are able to do simple arithmetic with these values or range proofs with these values without decrypting them, without knowing them. So you are able to verify the truth of a statement like, um, no new coins were created in this transaction, without actually knowing how many coins were used in the transaction. Marios has a follow-up question. How could you create a zero-knowledge proof transaction? It seems that it is computationally complicated and not time efficient. That's true. Zero knowledge proofs are computationally complicated and not particularly efficient. They're not efficient in computation in time, but they're also not efficient in size. Uh, one of the big problems with zero knowledge proofs in general and uh, homomorphic encryption and various types of zero knowledge proofs, including range proofs, is the fact that they produce a very large amount of data. In order to be able to validate these zero knowledge proofs, you need a lot of data. So transactions using these systems can be ten times larger than transactions that don't have zero knowledge proofs. And this has been something that's been holding back the technology. Most of the development in zero knowledge proofs is in being able to express them in less space, uh, to use less data to communicate a zero knowledge proof. So all of the great innovations that have come out of that space are about compressing the proofs so that they are viable, so that you can actually create uh, transaction sizes that are uh, reasonable, uh, that can be propagated. And it's not computationally efficient, and it's not space efficient, and it's not time efficient. It's not intended to be. That's the trade-off. The trade-off is that in order to get very robust privacy, you lose some of the efficiency. Okay. Hello. Hello. Um, I've been aware of you since last year, um, and you seem to be a person who really likes Bitcoin and the blockchain and all the benefits it might give. Very good. But thank you. I want you to try to play devil's advocate. Yes. For me, and you might have received this question before. What it? What could be the biggest um, danger? to Bitcoin that can be thrown by, let's say, the banks or by international governments. Very good. That yes. Can actually, maybe throw it off its original course of trying to be decentralized and just being, you know, a force for the individual. And then I, I get that question quite often, so I can answer it very, very directly and very simply. Um, I think the the biggest weakness that Bitcoin has is that the base layer, the first layer blockchain is insufficiently private. It does not have strong enough privacy anonymity guarantees. And what that means is, if you're trying to build a currency on top of it, that threatens the currency's fungibility. Okay, so fungibility. First of all, it's a great word. I really like saying it because it sounds so much fun, but listening to it is not even half as much fun as actually saying it. You should try it, because there's an F, and then you go into some N's and G's, and it's fungibility. It's really a lot of fun to say. Uh, the problem is nobody knows what the hell it means. So allow me to... How many people here know what fungibility means? Oh, about half the audience. That's great. That's great. It's a weird economic term. What fungibility means is that in a system of money, it's important to not be able to distinguish between different units. Meaning, if I'm holding 
is 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 one uh, let's say one thousand won. Okay, that's a paper bill here. I haven't actually touched Korean money yet. I've only used debit cards. I'm holding a thousand won bill, right? If I go to a store and I give it to a storekeeper and I say, "Here's a thousand won. Give me something you can buy with a thousand won. Probably something very small." They'll say, "Oh no, I, I don't like this one." Do you have any other thousand won bills? Not this one. But why? It's I don't know. Its number ends in a three. I don't like those. I, I want one that doesn't end in a three. Do you have another thousand? They can't do that. In fact, it's illegal to do that. Right? They have to accept that any thousand won bill is the same as any other thousand won bill. They can't say, "Oh, this one." I don't know, the corner is a bit creased, so I'm only going to give you 950 on that one. Right? And if you had that kind of situation, you'd actually have a problem. How do we know? Because it's happened. So in Roman times, when they had coins, I don't know if you've noticed, have you noticed that almost in every country, if you have a metal coin, it has little lines around the outside. Have you noticed that? Do you know why those are there? So they don't shave, that. So they don't shave them. So back in the days when money was actually made of something valuable like silver or gold, if you had a coin and the edge was smooth, then you could just shave off a bit of silver and gold and make it a tiny bit smaller and give it to someone and then you keep the shavings. And if you do that with enough coins, eventually someone notices. They're like why is this coin banana shaped? <laughs> it's like, is this part of the lunar cycle? Because this looks like a half moon. You know, where's the rest of the coin? Um, so what they started doing is they put those ridges around as an anti-theft device, so that if you shave it, it's visible that you shave it. If you try to make the ridges again, because they're symmetrical, it's very obvious that you've cut new ridges into the coin. So that's why they have a little circular ridge around the edge and that's why they have the little lines. So what happens in Roman times with silver coins is they started trading for different values depending on how badly they were shaved. So it's like having a thousand won bill and someone is saying, I'll give you eight seventy six for that one. Uh, that one looks pretty good. I'll give you nine hundred and twenty three. Well the problem is if money starts having a price it stops working as money very well. If each piece of money has a different price, but not the one that's on it, but a slight discount depending on whether it's been tainted or shaved or something like that, you have a problem. And that's what fungibility is about. Um, you know, there's another funny situation that we have. I don't know if you've heard this statistic, but um, every single dollar bill you've ever touched has cocaine on it. It also has E. coli. You, yeah. Um, so, so every single dollar bill you touch has cocaine on it, a and the reason for that is because uh, there's this way of rolling up a, co a dollar bill and turning it into a straw and using it to ingest cocaine. So people, you know, <laughs> that kind of thing. Um, so that means that eventually you take this dollar bill, it touches the other dollar bills in your pocket, they get a bit of cocaine, and then you give it to someone and it touches their bills, they give etc. And so everything has cocaine on it. Now this causes a bit of a problem because what if you had a test and you could run a test, and they actually suggested doing this in the 80s, and they said, well, let's test the dollar bills, and if they have cocaine, we won't accept them. And then they realized this was a very bad idea, because it would cause chaos. Can you imagine if every shopkeeper had to have a little testing system, and they'd be like, oh, I'm sorry, this has too much cocaine on it, I won't take this one, but this one has just enough, I'll take this one. And so then what would happen is people would pay more for the ones that were clean and less for the ones that were dirty. And then you have a real problem because then the value of money can vary a lot. Not just 2% or 3%, but even 20%. Well, that's happening in Bitcoin today. You can actually buy Bitcoin that just came straight out of a fresh block, fresh from the oven, still smelling of hashes, and <laughs> And right from the Coinbase, right? 
they sell those at a higher price than Bitcoin that has touched other people's wallets. And the reason is that because you can trace Bitcoin from transaction to transaction to transaction, if you give Bitcoin to your exchange that you received from someone else, and that person received it from another person who received it from another person who stole it from MT Gox, your exchange is going to go, ah, too dirty. No, thank you. And they'll shut down your account. And that's a problem. That's a big problem. Because if you start doing that across all of the money circulation, you end up breaking money. It stops working as money. The whole point of money is that you have one universally recognizable, verifiable thing that has one price. Right? It is the price. That's its purpose. And if it starts having different prices, it doesn't work. So fungibility is a big problem. So, um, and how does fungibility relate to privacy? They relate in a very simple way. Uh, if you have strong privacy, if uh, the money is anonymous, and if you can't trace where it's been before, then it becomes perfectly fungible. Then every unit is the same as every unit. You can't differentiate between them, and you can't have problems where the exchange will say, not this one, yes, this one, or where they trade for different prices. And today we don't have perfect fungibility in Bitcoin. There is perfect fungibility in some other blockchains. <clears throat> Uh, Privacy-focused ones like Zcash and Monero and many others that have come out since. Um, I would like to see privacy improvements in Bitcoin. And the reason I'd like to see them is because this is a very specific attack vector for governments. And what they can do is they can start circulating blacklists that say, any coin that has touched one of the following addresses is a bad Bitcoin. And then make the exchanges block any transactions. And they will set a limit. They'll say if it's changed addresses less than six times since it's touched one of these, they call that six hops, then you can't accept it. And that would cause very, very serious problems to Bitcoin. Of course, what it would also cause to Bitcoin is the immediate implementation of strong privacy and anonymity. Which is one of the ironic things that when you're working in a dynamic system, is that um, if you have a threat like that from government, if you have an attack like that from any government, the response that happens is that the organism, the system, evolves to develop defenses against that particular attack. And one of the reasons we don't have strong privacy today is because Bitcoin isn't being attacked enough. And this applies to all cryptocurrencies. If cryptocurrencies start getting attacked using privacy as the attack mechanism, two things are going to happen. One, privacy will become very valuable, which means that any cryptocurrencies that do strong privacy immediately become much more valuable, because everybody wants the private ones. And two, every cryptocurrency that doesn't have privacy, the very next release has privacy. Um, which probably is also why governments haven't tried to attack in that way. Because they actually like the fact that they can track these things, and they know that if they attack it in a very obvious way, they'll stop being able to track them because they will immediately get privacy. Gareth asks, privacy coins like Monero and Zcash are invaluable to people in authoritarian regimes uh, who want to try to protect their wealth from government confiscation and inflation. I wonder if the new implementations of Mimblewimble, such as Grim and Beam, will be a better option than the existing privacy coins, um, such as Monero or Zcash. Mimblewimble is a much smaller, more efficient blockchain and can store more transactions. Can you see it displacing the current top two privacy coins over time? I don't know. Um, I think it's important to realize that Mimblewimble has different trade-offs both in terms of security and privacy, as well as in terms of efficiency and scalability. And I like to see um, this experimentation continue across all of the privacy coins, because it enables us to see how different trade-offs and different privacy techniques uh, can be uh, used, and what their um, pros and cons are. And perhaps in the future, we can see uh, more of those privacy techniques combined, so that we see a lot of, uh, let's say, cross-pollination between the research 
and development teams in these various privacy coins and other coins. So techniques invented in one place are used in another. That's one of the wonderful things about working in a broad open source ecosystem like cryptocurrencies and open blockchains, where an invention made in one place can be used anywhere else. It's not encumbered by patents or um, you know, and even if it is under open source, that doesn't really matter. So we will see a lot of uh, cross pollination. Whether Grin and Beam displace the current two privacy coins over time, I don't know. It depends what you mean by displace. If you mean that they might rise to have a larger market cap, I don't really think those metrics are meaningful. Uh, the question is, do these new technologies offer more choices for people operating under conditions where privacy is absolutely essential? And I think they do. Um, so, do they displace? There, there really isn't. This isn't a zero-sum competition. Um, Grin and Beam can, can thrive and grow uh, both together uh, as well as against uh, the other privacy coins without uh, really any sacrifices. It's not a zero-sum competition. So I'm actually hoping to see not only these privacy coins, but more privacy coins develop and explore other areas. That's the only way we learn. Of course, not all of them are going to survive or succeed or flourish. That's okay too. These experiments are not uh, about winning. They're about offering choice and exploring different avenues. Could you comment on the Zcash inflation vulnerability that was recently exposed and whether this has implications on the feasibility of base layer privacy on Bitcoin? Many Bitcoin proponents believe that the fixed supply of Bitcoin is one of its greatest value propositions. Is there a risk that by obfuscating the base layer for privacy reasons would make it less auditable and create a risk of inflation bug that goes unnoticed for quite a long time? In the case of ZK Snarks, the vulnerability existed for eight months. And if I understand correctly, there's no way of knowing if it was exploited. Would it not be reckless to deploy uh, nascent cryptography on the whole network? given the, the fact that second layer solutions may prove to be sufficient. So this is a great question about the balance between privacy technologies and the risk that privacy technologies introduce uh, in the form of an inflation bug. So let's explore this a bit better and explain what exactly is happening in this case. So one of the important privacy technologies is the ability to encrypt the amount of a transaction, so they can't see how much money is being moved within a transaction, in such a way that you can still audit the amount uh, without knowing what it is. And there are a number of different techniques to do this, zero-knowledge proofs uh, of various forms. Zero-knowledge proofs are proofs where you can prove that something is true without knowing the specific details. For example, um, within a UTXO set, or within the, a transaction itself, you have a certain number of inputs on one side and a certain number of outputs on the other side. A transaction is valid if the total of inputs minus the total of outputs is equal to uh, an amount greater than or equal to zero. It is equal to the fees, which is the leftover, or zero uh, if there is no fee, which is unlikely today. But let's say the total on each side of the equation should balance. Um, you should have effectively double entry bookkeeping. Um, you shouldn't be able to spend more money than you have. Now, if the amounts are encrypted, how do you know that they add up? And that's where you get a zero knowledge proof. And a zero knowledge proof is where you can do mathematics. Um, you can do basic arithmetic on two values that are encrypted in a way that doesn't reveal their value. So you can do a subtraction, you can do a range proof, as it's called, where you can show that the encrypted values of the inputs, let's call that bananas, uh, minus the encrypted values of the outputs, let's call that apples, is within a range that is greater than zero. Um, and you don't know what number bananas is, and you don't know what number apples is, but you can do the mathematics and say, you can do the arithmetic and say um, bananas minus apples greater than zero. Um, and that's it. That's what a range proof is. Now, if there's a bug in there, 
what you can do is actually create Bitcoin on the encrypted side of outputs or create the cryptocurrency of the of the system in a way that increases the supply. You're essentially generating currency from nothing uh, and introducing it into the supply in a way that can't be detected because the values are encrypted. They'll still validate in the long term. This is a very serious bug. Uh, in the case of Zcash, fortunately, it happened in an environment where there hasn't been much use and is still very experimental. And this is a great lesson for Bitcoin. This creates a fundamental challenge for privacy. If you introduce privacy in the base layer of a cryptocurrency that has very strict monetary characteristics, what if there's a bug in the range proofs of that um, that cause uh, a significant inflation bug? This is one of the criticisms levied against uh, zero knowledge snarks, zk snarks, as they're called, um, because this is relatively new cryptography. Um, and as a result, it hasn't been broadly tested. Uh, it has been extensively peer-reviewed, but it hasn't been broadly tested. And it's quite complex stuff. So, um, in this case, there was a bug. Uh, the bug was actually uh, goes all the way back to the equations in the white papers describing zk snarks. So it, it was identified. You know, one of the equations was wrong. Um, and no one noticed for eight months. Um, so the question is, what about adding things like bulletproofs, which are used in confidential transactions, uh, currently implemented only in uh, test networks around Bitcoin um, and side chains like the Liquid side chain? What about adding that technology to the Bitcoin base layer so as to improve the privacy of the Bitcoin base layer? Is it too early to add that technology? I don't know. Um, and is the risk too great that that might introduce an inflation bug? I think the argument that you can do it in second layer solutions and that's sufficient isn't absolutely true. Uh, I think a lot of the privacy solutions are much better applied in the base layer um, because it's very difficult to maintain privacy on the second layer if the base layer can be monitored and surveilled. However, this is a true consideration now. This is a real design trade-off. And this is the essence of cryptocurrency design, I think, uh, and the very difficult fundamental trade-offs that exist in engineering cryptocurrencies. There are no perfect solutions. Everything involves giving a bit in one area in order to gain a bit in another area. You can't just be best at everything. Um, and so um, we're going to see this debate happen very strongly, and I think it's part of the reason why it's going to be difficult uh, to introduce privacy technologies in the base layer of Bitcoin. I hope uh, that we will introduce privacy technologies in the base layer of Bitcoin, even if there is a small risk that there are exploitable inflation bugs. Um, that could go undetected um, and cause some problems with the inflation of the supply of Bitcoin. I think in the long run, the risk of not having sufficient privacy in, in the base layer is greater than the risk of a small inflation bug, uh, which I think with maturity will not go undetected for very long. But this is a very difficult risk analysis, and I'm not confident about that opinion. I'm kind of leaning more towards privacy at the moment. I could be persuaded otherwise. I'm not certain or fixed in my opinion on this. I would like to hear a broader debate. I'd like to hear and understand how big is the risk. Um, I understand the risk of not having privacy in the base layer. I, that, to me, that's a, a clear risk. It, it involves undermining the fungibility of Bitcoin, uh, being able to introduce regulation, legislation that makes it very difficult for anyone other than criminals to use Bitcoin, because the very use of Bitcoin um, that involves uh, using blacklists and whitelists and tracking addresses and surveillance and complying with uh, surveillance uh, regulations uh, will, will make it impossible for um, normal businesses, for legitimate users, 
uh, to use cryptocurrency. So that's, that's a real risk, and I understand that I can quantify that risk. The problem is, on the other side of this equation, is a risk that I don't understand. Uh, I don't know how big the risk of an inflation bug is. It's not zero. We know that now. We know that it's not zero risk because it's already happened. But how big is it? And how repeatable is that bug? And how many other bugs could possibly exist? That I don't know. And I'm I'm not qualified to know it. I'm I'm not a cryptographer, uh, and I don't understand um, range proofs to that degree, um, so that I can. Uh, evaluate that risk. So this is a broader debate that we're going to have in this community, but it's a very interesting glimpse into the very important, very serious trade-offs that exist. And maybe, maybe it turns out that the risk of inflation is much greater than uh, the risk of not having privacy, and we really need to work about moving privacy to the second layer. I don't know. I could be persuaded either way at this point. So we'll find out. This is a very interesting debate to come in the crypto space. And it's not going to play out just in Bitcoin. This is going to play out in every cryptocurrency that has the same fundamental challenges of protecting privacy and protecting uh, the integrity of the currency.